all through the years is that we're our own worst enemy, that it's easier to be forgiving for others than it is for ourselves. That doesn't mean letting yourself off the hook for bad behavior, but realizing that nobody is perfect, nobody will ever be perfect, and that the whole idea is that every time we make a mistake, we have a chance to grow a little bit in wisdom. Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by Florida Community College at Jacksonville. I'm Carol Spaulding, your host, and today we're delighted to have with us Dr. Joan Borsenko. We're really glad to have you, Joan. We are thrilled that somebody with your background, a medical scientist, a psychologist, uh, incredible training from Harvard, uh, has, has author of eight books, uh, has come today to help us explore the ideas of this wholeness idea. Uh, can you tell us how you got into the, from a medical scientist, psychologist point of view, to do the work that you do today? Well, sure. It actually started when I was 10, and I had a very serious mental illness. I had, I was psychotic, and then I developed obsessive compulsive disorder. There were no behavioral therapies back then for what I had, nor were there any good drugs, no good psychopharmacology. And I ended up having a spontaneous remission, actually through prayer. And at 10, this really made a big impression. And I thought after that time, I got to figure out what happened. What's neuroscience? What's the brain? How does a 10-year-old get completely crossed wires like that? And what was the spiritual experience that I had? So I knew from an early age that I needed to study science and psychology and also the spiritual component. And that's what I've always done. That's amazing. So you went, you went to become you went to Harvard to become a medical That's scientist. That's right. To and become a psychopharmacologist. That was my plan. And while I was there, I got fascinated by cancer cells. So I left the psychopharmacology and I started to do cancer research and then did a postdoc in that. And then my father actually died of cancer while I was an assistant professor at Tufts Medical School. And I, I realized, Carol, that I knew so much about growing cancer cells and tissue culture. And I knew all about their receptor sites, but I didn't know a single thing about what a family went through when one of their family members was ill like that, about the big choices that many people have between quality of life and quantity of life. And I decided I had to leave the laboratory and do that. So I went and did a second postdoc at Harvard in a brand new field back in 1978. That field was called behavioral medicine. And my mentor in that field was Dr. Herbert Benson. I'd actually worked with him as a graduate student when he was doing the very first biofeedback experiments. And since that time, he had elucidated the physiology of what he called the relaxation response, the body's antagonist to the stress or fight or flight response. And I thought, what a wonderful way to work with people. And that's how I actually decided that I would leave the laboratory, a personal experience, needing to heal my grief over my father's death by giving something back to other people. I think um, your father's death is, is probably one of those watershed things that happened to you where mm -hmm. um, you can cure the disease but hurt the person. That's exactly, in his case, what happened. He was given a drug to keep his leukemic cells from multiplying, but it created in him a very serious mental illness. He became manic, and it was like a stranger had moved into his body, and eventually, Carol, he committed suicide. In fact, right here in Florida. So I always think of him and send a little prayer when I'm here in Florida, because that was a very difficult thing for the whole family to get over. And it shows you that sometimes you really can cure the cells but kill the patient. And uh, I didn't want that to happen if I could help it to another family. Well, I think that that's amazing. Um, do you have, does your, does your evolution then take you into the psychology of, and do you leave that or do you try and pull both of those things together? I try to pull them together. 
Because what I'm fascinated in, obviously, is spontaneous remission, having had one myself, and then how different people respond to the crises in their lives. Because we've always seen this. Everybody knows people who go through a terrible time, and somehow they come out wiser. They come out more compassionate or kinder or transformed in some way. And other people stay stuck, or they become alcoholic, or they get bitter, or they lock themselves up. And I wanted to know what the difference was between those who were great copers and those who folded under stress. And then I wanted to know, could we teach those good coping skills to others? And so I ended up with Herbert Benson and a psychiatrist, Elon Kutz, forming a mind-body clinic at one of the Harvard Medical School hospitals that I ran for most of the 1980s. So what did you find out? Well, what I found out is that these are teachable skills and that the most important teaching is to realize you're not alone. I think, oh, all the things we taught in this 10-week group program, we taught, of course, the relaxation response. We taught coping skills. We found that forgiveness was a very important thing that a lot of people were constantly blaming themselves and holding on to regrets were staying stuck by blaming others and that those were all important things but we found mostly people healed each other by telling their stories by sharing by realizing that they weren't alone and by realizing that they hadn't been singled out by God fate or destiny for something difficult to happen and that rather than it being some kind of punishment it could be a gift actually of growth and of course all during that I was interested in the science of it do good copers have a stronger immune system and the answer is yes to people who are connected with social support as opposed to those who are lonely have better immune system and the answer to that is yes and a better cardiovascular system too so are these causes is that is that the link well now we get onto very murky ground because we get into what has been called new age guilt and that is if you believe in the mind-body connection it's a short leap to make the mistake to say everything is due to what happens in the mind and if somebody gets ill it's their own fault for thinking wrong mm -hmm. and I that that's an oversimplified way of thinking to my mind there are a lot of factors that cause illness there's genetics there's of course what goes on in the environment which is an enormous cause of illness probably eighty percent of all cancers are caused by environmental pollution and the mind is part of that if of course you manage to be chronically immunodepressed because you're a grinch who can't stand yourself and other people cynical out of touch and all those things lonely and you have not enough of a kind of white cell called a natural killer cell it's more likely that a cancer caused by some other factor will grow but it's only one of many factors this issue of forgiveness if you hold grudges if you can't let it go does that make you sick it absolutely does it's one of the biggest causes of stress the body releases a hormone called cortisol when it's chronically stressed and people who have trouble forgiving tend to release a lot of cortisol. In fact, you might remember Hans Selye. He got a Nobel Prize. He was the father of stress. He studied this whole cortisol connection. It's an interesting anecdote about him. In his 70s, he was diagnosed with mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lining of the lungs. And it's a, it's a difficult cancer. And the doctor said, well, Dr. Selye, maybe you have four months to live. So he thought, what can I do in four months? And he thought he'd write his memoirs. So he started to go through his journals. And he'd kept one from the time he was a med student. The first journal contained the story of one of his mentors who'd stolen Selye's research and published it for his own. And of course, all of the anger came up. And he realized he'd been hanging on to this for 50 years. And he thought, what should I do? Should I expose this person or let go of it? And he thought, the person's dead. If I'm holding on to it, whose body is suffering the chronic stress? So he managed to forgive the person. And as he went through his journals, the whole thing was a forgiveness exercise. And about a year later, <clears throat> excuse me, it occurred to him that he was not dead yet. And so <laughs> he went back to his doctor. And sure enough, he had had a spontaneous remission of his cancer. Now, 
I love spontaneous remission stories, but it's important to realize that not everybody who forgives is going to have a spontaneous remission of illness. Most likely, you will live longer than you would have, but the most important thing is that you will heal yourself. And to heal is different than to cure. To cure is to restore physical function, but to heal is to feel authentic, in touch with who you really are, able to offer your gifts, to be in right relation with other people, to feel like you've got good relationships, you can communicate, that you can give them and they can give you. And then for many people, it has to do with right relationship to a larger source, to God. So that's healing in a nutshell. So does it have to do with, I mean, all the religions seem to have this forgiveness part to it, that you yes, must forgive. Yes, they do. And uh, I did a, actually an audio program a couple of years ago called 70 times 7 from a quotation of Jesus in the New Testament when someone said, how many times should we forgive? And the numerology of 70 times 7, according to, you know, old Jewish gematria or numbers, really means infinitely. So you can look and say that the heart teaching of every religion really is love thy neighbor as thyself. And forgiveness is a very big part of it. How do you, is, is guilt a, a byproduct of this lack of forgiveness? I mean, where does the, how does the guilt work also? Well, there are a couple of kinds of guilt, good guilt and bad guilt. <clears throat> and, you know, thank goodness for good guilt that when we do something wrong, our conscious, the voice of that higher uh, potential within us speaks forth and says, you know, you really blew this. You could have done better. That's good. But what I found when I ran the Mind Body Clinic is that a lot of people suffered from bad guilt. And that is, it wasn't guilt over anything they did or didn't do but a sense that somehow they weren't a good enough person, that whatever they did was never enough and never quite right. And that, of course, is related to self-esteem. And one of the most important things we have to do to heal is to begin to like ourselves and to raise that sense of self-esteem. Is it an educated guilt that makes it good guilt, bad guilt? I mean, is it a natural thing for people to know the difference or to have a good conscience? Well. I think it's natural for people to want to have a good conscience. If we're lucky enough to have had good enough mothering and fathering so that we have a conscience, it's natural to want to keep it clear. And in fact, there's a great piece of research on that, which was done in Texas at Southern Methodist University. And it was inspired by a man who ran lie detector tests for the police department and who knew a faculty member at SMU by the name of Dr. James Pennybaker. And he told Penny Baker the most amazing thing. People come in, they're basically, you know, haven't confessed their crime. They could leave free. During the lie detector test, they confess to me. And instead of the lie detector test showing all kinds of tension, they come instantly to peace and relaxation. Furthermore, he said they bond to him. They send him Christmas cards. They send him birthday cards that at some point it's a great psychological and physiological relief to confess. So Penny Baker did some studies and he found basically even confessing to a shower curtain with no one behind it improved immune function and decreased illness measured for six months and also confessing into a journal. As long as you told your emotions, not just the facts, but really got the emotions out also stimulated the healing defenses of the body. Talking about the emotion. That's right. Because a lot of people, you see, we keep the emotions in. And we feel, well, if our grief and sadness don't get out, who will know? But if they don't get out, they wreak havoc in the body. Emotions are meant to be messengers that tell us that something needs to be put right. So we have to pay attention to them. How does all this emotional stuff work on the job, for example? trying to be cool or trying to be organized. Right. And how do you deal with stress in that part of your life versus maybe some of these more personal things that we've talked about so far? Well, first of all, I have to say that oftentimes on a job, people need training as to how to deal with their stress. There's been a lot of research, research of a Dr. Suzanne Kobasa, how do people deal with job stress? She looked at AT&T when it was undergoing divestiture. And some people, of course, thrived, and other people fell apart. And she found that the thrivers, the stress-hardy ones, had three things going for them, three attitudes. 
what she calls the three C's, because they all begin with C, challenge, commitment, and control. And that is they're the sort of people who tend to think of change as a challenge rather than as a threat. To know that you can never control what goes on in, in the world. We all know that. John Lennon had a great line. He said, life is what happens to us while we're making other plans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you realize the only true control you have is your own attitude. And the third C is commitment. And that means an orientation towards some higher vision that keeps you going. So for example, on the job, if you've got somebody who comes in every day and says, ugh, I hate being here, but I have to make a living, they're going to be a lot more stressed than somebody who says, I'm here because I believe in education. I believe that everybody deserves a chance. And then they're serving a higher goal. So that those things are really important. But even if you're stress hardy, you need some place for your emotions to be expressed. Women have a little less trouble than men because we naturally gravitate toward one another. You can go into any lady's room anywhere in the world and you can find great therapy happening over the sink between perfect strangers who are likely to say what they're thinking and give each other a few little words of encouragement. And it turns out that men have a lot more trouble in this dimension than women because of that and that Dr. Dean Ornish, who runs a wonderful program for the reversal of coronary artery disease through a very low-fat vegan diet and social support and attitudinal change and meditation, that what he has found is that men need to learn to talk to one another because that's a very intrinsic part of recovery. So we have a little step up there, I can <laughs> us see women. That. Yes. Well, You've, you mentioned many times Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, and being able to deal with concentration camps and that attitude right. thing. Is that a part of what makes your research? That's a, that's a big part of it. I was very touched, as were so many others, by Victor Frankl's book because I lost half my family in the Holocaust. And I know people who were Holocaust survivors. And some of them have really become bittered. My mother was not a Holocaust survivor, but she's the one who lost the family. And that was the end of her belief in God. She said the whole thing is a joke. If there's a God up there, then what kind of God is it who would allow babies to be gassed? And other people have managed instead to heal and transform through even an experience as difficult as that. And Frankel was one of them. And he also related it to if people physically survived from the camps, he said, people who can find a meaning for their suffering are likely to manage to live until liberation. That is, unless the gas chambers get them first. But people who find no meaning and who give up hope, he said, had deficits in the immune system. So the next time cholera or typhoid went through camp, they went. Either that or they sit on their cots, their hearts develop in a regular rhythm, and they simply keel over from uh, rapid cardiac death. So he was one of the first who talked about psychoneuroimmunology, how our emotions affect our immune system, and also psychocardiology, how our emotions affect our hearts. So the psychology is one way of dealing with the stress by doing your attitude, and, and it affects your physical. Does the reverse also, is the reverse also true? Can you run or exercise your way out of stress? Or do you still have to have this meaning in your life. You need both. Suzanne Kobasa's research showed that health habits were really important, that exercise was incredibly important, but that stress hardiness was a more important factor in dealing with stress. So that's the component of attitude and higher meaning. Is your research now focused on what? Physical, mental combinations, wholeness? Where is it going? My main interest in the last several years has really been in women. So a couple of, well, just over a year ago, I published a book called A Woman's Book of Life, The Biology, Psychology, and Spirituality of the Feminine Life Cycle. So I traced our changes in brain development, in hormones, to see why it was. I wanted to know why women bloomed in midlife. And I wanted to give us the sense that the societal idea of being over the hill by 50 was all wet. We were just coming into our power just coming into the best period of our life. 
And now I'm extending that work. I do a lot of work with women, uh, about eight weekends a year. I have retreats for women. And right now I'm very interested in an exploration of the spiritual lives of women. Does it differ from the lives of men? Because almost all religions and spiritual practices were developed for men. And I think women have a kind of intrinsic spirituality based on relationality, the way that we develop a sense of self, not independently of others, the way that boys develop, but in relation to one another. So that's what I'm working on. Well, in these retreats, what, what's your emphasis? Do you just have people interact with each other, or are you trying oh, to move we do. an agenda? Well, first, we have a marvelous time. <laughs> we start on Friday night, <clears throat> and we celebrate a Sabbath celebration. So I always say to people, if you're Christian, what do you think Jesus was doing on Friday night? And of course, he was celebrating the Sabbath, which is time aside. And as women, we really need that time aside. We need special sacred time when we can put away other people's needs and attend to our own inner life, have joy, be with one another. So that's what we do. And we do um, a number of things during the weekend. We, we do certainly spiritual discussion. We do some prayer. We do meditation. We do some work healing memories. My retreat partner, Elizabeth Lawrence, is a, path, is a pastoral counselor and trained in a specific technique of letting go of some of these negative memories of not forgiving self and others and working that through. And then Sunday morning is a celebration. A, a Saturday night, people learn song, or some do sacred dance, or last time we did sacred theater. We acted out Adam and Eve. Everybody took a part, including the serpent, and we did a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful piece about that. So everyone offers their gifts on Saturday morning. And being women, rituals naturally occur. So we had, for example, at the last retreat, a woman who'd lost two children, two babies, one to leukemia and one just shortly after birth. And she was reading from her journal uh, what she was writing to her little daughter who had died of leukemia and what her little daughter was answering her in her heart. And then everybody who had lost someone, whether they'd lost a child or a spouse or a relationship, came and held her. And there was a kind of group grieving. And when that cleared, there was an incredible celebration, a sense that here we were bonded in the unity of life, telling the truth, supporting one another. So what happens at the retreats? We laugh, we cry, we eat, <laughs> we have quite a time. It sounds like a holiday with people that you grow to. I guess love or something. You do grow yeah, to love. Oftentimes the women who come to these retreats stay mm -hmm. connected for, I can't say the rest of their lives because we've only done them for seven years, yeah. but for a long time. Well, that's fairly risky to be connected anymore, isn't it? Well, I think what's happened in our society is it's become so fast-paced that people have forgotten that connection is our basic spirituality, to be in connection. The studies of women in particular have shown that women in especially the working mother role in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, their priorities are such that work and children are number one. They're going great guns. If they're married, the spouse is a distant third. But other women aren't even on the horizon. They don't have time. And that's hard because as, as women, we need that connection. We need that sense of emotional expression. And we've gotten too isolated. So part of my message is you have to bring that back into your life. You have to make time for yourself Absolutely. and your friends. Absolutely. Yourself and your friends. And, and whatever real family there is or new family there That's can be. That's right. We have about two minutes to sort of summarize where we are. And you've given a wonderful suggestion. Are there any other things that you would tell people as they try and grow to the future and deal with stress or illnesses or other kinds of things? Yeah, be gentle with yourself. <laughs> what I found all through the years is that we're our own worst enemy, that it's easier to be forgiving for others than it is for ourselves. That doesn't mean letting yourself off the hook for bad behavior, but realizing that nobody is perfect, nobody will ever be perfect, and that the whole idea is that every time we make a mistake, we have a chance to grow a little bit in wisdom. 
and that transforming our wounds and our difficulties into wisdom is really the reason we're here. I think Mother Teresa put it really well. She said, the reason for human life is to be able to give and to receive love. And that's it. That's how we're going to be happy emotionally and as strong as possible physically. So we need to work on creating opportunities to give and receive that's right. love. Okay, we'll leave the program with that thought. That was a wonderful thought. Thank you all very much for being with us. This is Carol Spalding and Dr. Joan Barsenko uh, with Worth Quoting at FCCJ. Thank you again. You're very welcome.